he, he quite enjoys it. I was getting quite annoyed about this and sort of starting to shout at the TV saying, go on, just, just put your foot somewhere near it, at least attempt. But I think, yeah, the three players that I picked out as being especially good, obviously, Mohan, we talked about Danny Maguire, I thought had a very good game when he wasn't chatting to the referee. <laughs> and it was well, like, he is really... the captain. He does have some... Yeah, some... it's just... I, I mean, I never like the players. I have a bugbear player of um, John Wilkin. I've never never got on with, partly because he is always up in the referee's face. Like, just get on with it. And it's always, generally, the teams that are winning that are doing it. Yeah, well... The time. Yeah, every team, has, every team has one of these players. Carl Ablett was uh, fulfilling the role for Leeds on uh, it's Friday taken night. Taken over, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and uh, Heffernan. I thought Heffernan had a had a good game, and uh, he was darting all over the shop. Well, his footwork for the first try, yeah, that, the, that Rovers scored was was really impressive. Um, but then equally, he showed great positioning and uh, acceleration for the second try. I mean, that was another example of a player. Um, taking a line and then changing the line very late as he's getting the ball, which makes it really hard to, for defenders. And there's two things that annoyed me about this game, which for a game the way we won, I shouldn't have been quite so. Yeah. But first one you being easily as well. Actually, there's three three things looking at the one that blooming cowbell saucepan nonsense. Yes, it's like put it or at least you know it's it's really Sky's fault. They should have put their um fx mic somewhere different because it's like oh come on that's all you could partly because the there was problem is is the cowbell bloke sits in the big one tier sort of stand that the cameras are on yeah so and because and, there's no no other atmosphere it echoes around that big stand so all of the microphones for all of the commentators will probably have been picking it up as well as the sound effects mics because it just echoes around that big stand and I'm already dreading Friday night because I know it's going to echo down around the almost empty away end at the DW if they open that stand up for Huddersfield fans. And it was just, it was just so constant, but it did die off in the second half, finally. I think he gave up at some point. <laughs> the other thing that annoyed me completely irrationally was the, why the two teams couldn't wear home kits or or just strips that wouldn't clash. But I do really like this year's Huddersfield kit. I think it's very smart. I do, but I just don't know. I think surely the Rovers home kit would have worked a lot better against it, whereas the purple and black number just was starting to merge in at a couple of points, certainly when I was looking at more grainy image sort of on the on the iPad. And the other thing I noticed was James Webster can't wear a hat. <laughs> It was sort of up round his ears, over his eyes, all sorts. <laughs> well, if he's as good at wearing hats as he is at coaching, um, <laughs> then then he's probably going to be really good at wearing hats when no one's looking at him. But really crap when people have got a focus on him and he's in a position of authority <laughs> with his hats. So, so yeah, you know, if you see him walking down the high street, he'll be wearing that hat perfectly. You, you watch. Um, right, yeah, the other thing for me to pick out, because I think you've covered it most most of the things up, and I think everyone else has picked out the great players. Heffernan was really good. I really like that Maguire and Atkins seem to be getting a combination together um, yeah. now, and that, that should only grow, um, and that means that Hull KR will become entertaining to watch. Um, but the other couple of things quickly is there was the return of um, James Donaldson, which is a big positive for him. Um, yeah. he, he is now one game further away from an injury and one game closer to his next, but let's hope that that next injury doesn't come as soon as they, as they tend to come around for him. And the other thing to mention from my uh, point of view is this one, is I'm really pissed off that Ryan Hinchcliffe only got a grade A charge and, a, and got off with no game banned for that chicken wing because I thought it was it that was, was deliberate, it was, ca- it was awful, it was intentional. Uh, it was nasty, and it was it has cynical as well. In... It was yeah, it was completely. unnecessary at that at that point in that field position. It was just why did you need to do that? Yeah, and I'm disappointed that the match officials didn't pick it up as a penalty uh, because if they had, they would have had to have simbined him at the time. Um, and I'm disappointed that he's not picked up any sort of ban for it because it was it was absolutely like obvious that he'd completely gone against the normal motion, completely deliberately done it, and. And I'm, and I'm worried that we're going down the line with the disciplinary too much of 
the, the, the suspensions are going to be a bigger deal for any injuries and injuries are going to be given as too much of an aggravating factor because what if Massimo Soy's arm was fine at the time and then actually he gets into the next impact big 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 session or something and it goes and it's because it's been weakened or something or because you know his nerves aren't quite right or they've been stretched but he didn't feel it at the time I don't know I just feel like there's there's more potential for injury from that sort of thing um even if it's not always caused immediately obviously yeah and because you did... should have got it should have carried a ban with all the ligament with all the ligaments so in the shoulder you don't you don't know what damage it is until quite a while and I think yeah and I think they they do tend to focus a little bit too much on the inj- injury rather than the actual intent and the what was behind potential it potential to cause injury and one of the one of the other things just one of your opinion what about the try that wasn't the video one that did take seemingly forever do you know why it was thursday night you're gonna to have to re- remind me a bit better so they that. were looking they were I'll looking get it up and see, who, see who didn't score it <laughs> I, yeah i've only written down yeah definitely a penalty for because there was a trip and pull back involved oh, okay no my opinion on that one was that quinlan was sort of walked across but i think he made the most of it took a little bit of a dive in my opinion and didn't need to go down but I don't think he was going to get there, so chose to go down. And the reason why I'm saying this, and part of what I'm is going to back me up for why I think it was ludicrous that all of a sudden this had a bit of an outcry across the the, the Twitter sphere about how it should definitely have been a penalty and shouldn't have been a. This is the one you're talking about, isn't it? Yeah. And shouldn't have been a goal line dropout. Um, well, cast everyone's mind back a week to when. Um, the Leeds Rhinos game was the most biased one-sided referee game that you've ever seen against Hull FC and one of the only two decisions that actually were really questionable was um, Josh Griffin kind of just edging across the Leeds runner for a high kick and then um, Leeds got given a penalty that Callum Watkins scored on that set from and everyone was up in arms saying that was way too soft to be a penalty. I did not see any more movement from the defensive player or any more contact than that Josh Griffin one. So it just shows you throw the context around and it's not Wigan or Leeds. And all of a sudden, the way the fucking Twitter artists see it is a completely different picture and it winds me up. So, no, I don't think it was a penalty. I think the right call was made. <laughs> right, fair enough. Um, I assume you think differently as a whole okay, I think I think there was two different ones now. Now I'm, I'm again I'm struggling to remember back that far, but I think there was one like that and there was one that was given as a penalty, but they should have been a but they well. They said it was should have been a penalty try, but I didn't think it was on the I first can't viewing. Remember that one, no, sorry. But unfortunately, yeah, that one's that one's gone to the sensor. Let's <laughs> let's uh, but at least at... you got me onto a rant, which I wasn't sure if was going to come out when Wigan hadn't played this week. But yeah, that did annoy me. How all of a sudden it's viewed completely differently by all the casual observers just because it's a, a plucky underdog who it happened to, rather than the uh, the reigning champions. Yeah, let's get some uh, look at the stats on this one then. Yeah, so the stats unsurprisingly confirm that Hull KR were richly deserving of their win despite giving up a 10-6 to 6 penalty count. They had nine breaks to five for 152 more metres and a hugely impressive 8.3 metres per carry, which was 1.3 metres per carry better than their hosts. Um, the game had the fewest errors of any game so far this year, so well done to both teams in not perfect conditions, for certainly. Oh. So well done to them on that count. Individually, um, Ryan Shaw for the winning... Hull KR side had two tries, 143 metres. I liked him improving his angle for his kick as well. He had a lot of kicks. Andrew Heffern in one try, two try assists, eight tackle busts, three clean breaks. Adam Quinlan had a try and three try assists, so he kind of chimed in with the halfbacks as well. I suppose we didn't talk about that extra link in the combination that actually we saw in this game. Rob Mulhern, finally, a try assist and 156 metres. Then for the losing... Um, Huddersfield Giants side Ryan Chicken Wing Hinchcliffe had 51 tackles, 15 of which were market tackles, so he worked really, really hard. Dale Ferguson five tackle bus, 127 meters, two clean breaks. Akuma Tai five tackle bus, 124 meters, and Seb Ikahifo five tackle bus, 117 meters, and five successful offloads. So the two frontline props really did have some sort of impact, but the um, the the link behind that, the skill position players behind that not good enough but given how many sets there to defend that's not really surprising 
Well, yeah, but this some of this some of this tackle bus and offloads and stuff from Ty and Ikahifa was up the field. Yeah. You know, but then what happened off the back of it is Cruz Lehman would make a dummy half run and then there'd nothing nothing else would follow. There'd be no set plays. It was a new combination, weren't it? Because Mamo was out of the side, so Rankin played at fullback. Gaskell went to six. Um, Baruff and Gaskell really weren't reading each other's games, and Rankin wasn't linking with either of them. Um, so, so yeah, it all died after good runs by the forwards. Um, poor, poor from Huddersfield. Very, very good and entertaining stuff from Hulkingston Rovers. Uh, moving on to a, a result that probably gave equal measure of delight to, to, to Rovers fans on Friday night. Um, it was Salford 24, Hull FC 8 in front of just shy of 3,000 people um, with Scott Mickey Mousecast as the referee in this one. Do you want to start us off on the fan views with our old friend Sarah? Yep, Scoot says, uh, lacklustre, lethargic, lame, limp, lifeless, listless, losers. Is there any L word she forgot there? Griffin, Green and Abdul, the only players of any vague credit. Burrito doesn't look like he's seen a rugby pitch before. No idea where to be positioned in a tackle defence. Tooley was scared of the ball coming to him. Washbrook too slow to play hooker. We need to play Lytton or sign someone. Bowden slimmed down too much. Connor and Sneed, very poor. Uh, JK SRLFC, uh, which is a new one on me. So um, thanks for getting in touch, JK. Let us know a bit more about yourself in the coming weeks. But it's great to have you on board. He said, he or she said, I saw a team who wanted it more, a team united in defence, solid until the end. I saw decisions go against us, but no one gave up. A near perfect second 40 for Salford and a thoroughly deserved win. Too many good performances to single out any one player made my weekend. Excellent. And on the other side, Joshua's granddad, a contender for the worst game of the season until Salford remembered how to play. Little skill on show from FC, struggling to find any positive except week closer to the return of Houghton and Kelly. Washbrook too slow at hooker, no zip. Halves not working together and a lack of punch from the pack. Don't get me started on Farimo. Abdul and Griffin only two to come out with any credit. Right. Well, they were definitely watching the same game, weren't they? Yeah. All, of, all of those three people. Um, it does seem like the first half was a was a was a struggle in this one. It would have been a cold, cold night. I'm guessing at the AJ Bell, which might not have helped get things going. Uh, ben Nakubawai got his first try for Salford, so so that was a a good thing for him because he's a promising player from from the World Cup from that Fiji side. So he was. He was very exciting. Um, maybe the only negative to come out of it from Salford's point of view was Chris Wellham picked up an ankle injury. But Ginger Pearl. But he's been no, that's that's uh, that's Liam Farrell. That's, that's not good. I think I, th- I think Chris Wellham got to it first. Yeah, but we're talking it's apples and oranges. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's oranges and oranges. <laughs> it's oranges and clementines. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, um, but uh, he's been named in the squad for this week's game, so so that shouldn't be too much of a harm there. Um, by by all accounts, um, you know, Robert Louis ran this one as, as firmly as he runs his household, and um, and was was properly in charge for Salford. So so I, su- I suppose it's a positive for them if he's going to stay there. That is that he's playing well because they really will rely on him. Looks like Jack Littlejohn had a bit of a, a better time of it than he's been having so far. Um I've not seen very much else other than other than the, the highlights on, on the of the tries for Friday night. But it, it does seem like, you know, Salford got their key men performing. Um and they got also for me the most important players in, in this squad uh, all together at the same time. I think Lee Mossop's huge for them and, and way yeah. underrated how good he can be for them along with Mark Flanagan. I think those two players were there for when they were good last year and not there for when they were bad last year and it was very, very noticeable. So those two being in the side um, I think is an important thing and they can't afford to lose any of these these players. Um, yeah, it's the one thing Salford don't have is depth. They don't, yeah. have, they don't have that second time and it, and it is partly because of their lack of a youth system in a way but equally the the squad players and the fringe players they've got are a level below you'd find at a, another team no completely completely agree I think the one thing about this game is we all we all predicted 
Liverpool were going to win this one, I'm sure. Yeah. Anyway, certainly me and Sarah, when we did the predictions Even on I would Monday have done. night last week, we went for Hull to win this one. Um, because at that time, you know, Salford had just sold they just sold Gareth O'Brien. Um, there was a lot of speculation. There was a lot of firefighting press releases about we don't have...